Christina show. Uh, happy Thursday. I am on the train right now, but uh, we gotta do what we gotta do. Um, tonight's guest is entrepreneur Joey Pierre. Awesome guy. So I had to come on. I couldn't wait any longer. Um, how you doing? Sorry I'm late. I love you. I was on, I was filming actually an FBI agent. Can you tell by the hair? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I hope you've been well. We're uh, mid seventies in episodes now, so I'm really happy. Hello, lady. Welcome. Um, I'll be in a car soon, so I won't be on this train the whole episode, which is awesome. But um, once Joey comes on, we'll have a nice time. And uh, yeah, if you have questions question box below and then uh, if you have any uh, comments you know what to do what's going on so different not my calm not my calm bedroom what's going on do it let me look for this guy Sorry, I have the train for a little You know where I'm going to. What's up, Joey? How you doing? How you doing? What's going on? I had to tell you. I see you. I see you coming in the matrix. Come on in. <laughs> Come on, computer. Work with me. I'm pressing accept. Wait. That's why. Let's try this again. Okay. Hold on, Joey. I see you. I see you. But it's not letting me hit except for some reason. Oh. Oh, oh shit. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Christina, let's go. You came, in, so you came in hot. How you doing, Joey? <laughs> I'm not used to saying Hey, that. hey hold on. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Thank you for being amazing and patient. You really are the best. I'm happy it was you tonight. Oh, no, of course, you know. I, I, I understand how it goes in, in this industry, so trust me. <laughs> yeah, what are, you, what are you drinking over there? <laughs> um, apple juice. Apple oh. juice. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> it's a little Sauvignon Blanc, you know. Yeah, you're of age. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, of course. But for the kids eventually watching, we wanna. Yeah, we wanna. But your kids. We wanna keep this. Your kid. How old are your kids? Uh, my kids are nine and five, respectively. Oh, my. oh I'm sorry. Nine and four. <laughs> <laughs> gonna yeah, be five. Five year difference. Five. Yeah, gonna be five and gonna be ten. Mm -hmm. Oh, babies. Those are babies, but you're a baby. When did you have them? When you were a baby? Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I was a, a toddler, if you will. <laughs> Running about, taking on the world. With cougars. <laughs> exact the mundo. <laughs> so I just want to let you know that this, I'm almost, you know, once I get to marriage, we'll have peace. The good part of the show is always the later part of the show anyway. Once I get to my car, mm -hmm. we'll be able to dive deeper. But let's let's get to brass taxes. You are okay. an entrepreneur, which is a really a grand title. Did you mm, know thank you, you wanted yes. to? I mean, we'll talk about how we met in a little bit. But did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur, artist, badass guy when you were little? Uh, 
ever since I was young, I always knew I wanted to be something grand. That is for sure. Uh, entrepreneur, if any of those ideas ever got into my head, it was more like maybe through the music I listened to. Hip hop always had like a big influence on me. So listening to a lot of rappers growing up like Jay-Z, um, Nas, Tupac, and Biggie, just the very nature of hip hop had a, had a very braggadocious inclination to just showcase who you are and what you bring to the table. And as hip hop evolved, you would see artists um, within their content just show how far they're making in, into the game. Um, and some may consider it materialism, but they were just pretty much showing the car, the jewels. But at the same time, the hip hop had meaning because they were coming from a place where they didn't have anything. So to be able to flaunt and to be able to showcase all these things now, now that they have come into money, um, and then to be able to make wise business moves, be, you know, the heads of their record labels, um, owning clothing brands, owning liquor brands. So seeing this kind of stuff as a child definitely uh, imbued a sense of, uh, uh, an entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit that uh, I'm pretty thankful for, you know? Yeah, no, it, no, just thinking about watching them over the years, it's like they seem to have not fallen into these big temptations and addictions too, you know? They've seemed to rise above all that. And that's not easy, I'm sure, at those levels of, of, of power and success, you know? No, it's not easy, but you know, it's the funny thing, depending on one takes from hip hop, if we take a rapper like Jay-Z, you talk about falling into the addictions, um, falling so much into the fast lane of what certain money can bring you. Uh, there's pros and cons to everything when it comes to the industry, or when it comes to any type of structure or system we analyze, how it all fits into the context of like capitalism, right? Uh, so when Jay-Z on his first album, Reasonable Doubt, he was speaking about drug dealing. And while other rappers would glorify these kind of topics, um, talk about how many kilos, how many grams they moved, um, how many ports they had and how much weight they sold, Jay-Z was actually giving you the other side to drug dealing. Yes, he was telling you about the money. But he was also, like, on the song The Evils, telling you how evil it was um, uh, and how it felt like you were kind of selling certain aspects of your soul, um, in a sense, exploiting, like, your own community. And it's not as cracked up as people thought it was. There's so many risks you have. You have to, like, look behind your shoulders every day to make sure that you're good. So um, just talking about the drug dealing game in that way when you see uh, Jay-Z in his background and where he came from. Uh, he spoke of, yes, the glitz and glamour, but uh, at the expense of like, hey, is this all worth it given all the risk? And so it's very important when you have rappers like that cover not just the pros, but the cons to living certain lifestyles. And that would be the same type of pros and cons that uh, one may encounter when it comes to starting a business or uh, when they want to do something for themselves. Uh, it, it it requires and an, uh, uh, self-actualization, uh, a deep look into yourself to know like where you are today and who you need to be and to pretty much go against societal norms of just saying like you want to go outside of the typical thing of doing the nine to five. And that's something uh, that is probably hard for most people. It, it, it's a risky endeavor. Um, but those who have the grit, it's not even just the grit. Uh, those who have like that foundational knowledge of backing them up, something that they believe in. If you believe in yourself, it, it's not even something that you see far fetch on. Can I do this? But it's only a matter of like, all right, when am I going to be like incredibly successful at this? And it's all based on um, the influences that you had growing up that will imbue that sense of um, drive and like inner knowing to just give you that confidence to know like you can go through with this kind of stuff.
Yeah, I think I think the through line of what you're saying is be on be honest and true to yourself and and being honest and true to yourself is obviously being true and honest to other people and that's it could also be a challenge on your path. The I believe the purer you are, the the more I hate to say powerful, the more potential you have, you know. Exactly. That's true. The more pure you are, the more power you have. Yeah, two peas, right? <laughs> it almost fell down right quick. Two peas in a pad. <laughs> I might add on the third P, right? Because um, that's also the more the more present you are. Because um, I think there's always a drive to like be as present as you can possibly be, as much as we want to always look towards the future to see like what can I have and how. Um, we want to envision how life can be. Um, we can only do that if we are incredibly conscious of our circumstances in the present, having a deep appreciation for where we are now. So, yeah, uh, adding that third P, I don't know. <laughs> it's maybe a superstition, but I believe in the power of three, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is a powerful Not, number, yeah. It is. No charmed reference, by the way. For, <laughs> Any of the charm fans out there? Yeah. <laughs> You're dating yourself. <laughs> huh? I love it. Let, let, let's go. Let's go off the new charm. The new charmed on CW. We're not talking about yeah, the old I one. <laughs> I like the old one. I don't know about that new stuff. <laughs> you know. You know the, the old. The old one is classic. Alyssa Milano, Holly Marie Combs. Um, Rose McGowan. Uh, what's her name? I Paige did. Rose McGowan. She was yes, young. exactly. She was. And and let let's not forget Shannon Doherty. Oh, yeah, he's the OG. No, Shannon Doherty was the OG. I yes, that's that. right. I forgot about that. <laughs> she was bad. I mean, I won't say anything. But um, so uh, <laughs> she was maybe better. Anyway, um, you and I know each other through the Navy. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Probably like two, a little two over two years before, well, probably a year before COVID. I think I would say. Probably. I mean, it depends on what year. Do you remember what year you came to OSU? Um, I graduated boot camp at the end of 2019, probably July 2019. I came to OSU. July 2019. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Right around my birthday. So, wow. yeah, it would be like two years, pretty much. We're in 2022. Well, going on three yeah, years. My God. Yeah, my three years <laughs> in two weeks. So almost exactly. Two, a little over two. But, um, you and I met, and we were both uh, hanging out in OSU, RSU, whatever. And our journey continues together into our new unit in the Bronx. Yes, NMCB27. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, it's, and it's nice that we're – I'm happy to grow with you. And, and the more we see each other, the more we, you know, can come together – like, I believe all relationships that last should be an infinity sign. They come and they go, you know? Yes. And you connect in the middle. And, and I think for you and I, we're lucky to have that. And you and I just started having deep conversations recently. But we've always respected each other. But now it's going, it's next level. Here's our next level. It's nice to grow with you. And I thank you for coming on the show. But that's, you know, also later. But um, yeah, no. So <laughs> the Navy is a, is a really good uh, thing for me. And and what what are your experiences in the Navy? When did you join? Um, I joined the Navy February of 2017. And it's so crazy. It almost feels like yesterday, but that's 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So that means next month I will be five years in the Navy. Wow. Absolutely ridiculous. Can't even believe it. I have to think about kind of reenlistment or if I'm going to retire at this point. <laughs> it's sort of yeah. It's nuts, right? Um it is but nuts. It's, when I it's close. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell me your thoughts because it's a jinx thing. I know it's a superstitious thing. Do you, Boba? but let me know later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll let everybody know what I'm gonna do when I get there. But uh joining the Navy I, I could say it was at a it was at a time where um, I felt like I needed a change in my life, and it brought about that necessary change. It's not something I kind of had to do, because I was definitely very established in the civilian world. I had a lot going on for me, um, media and communications degree. Uh, I almost was going to, like, apply for, like, News 12 networks, but 
Um, I had an IT side that was like very strong. Uh, so it was a choice for me to go like, do I want to continue going this journalistic route or do I want to do my tech route? And I chose like tech instead and always figured, you know, anything journalistic I want to do on the side or media related. Uh, those skills you never lose because as you know, it's like a hands-on thing. You learn all the skills you have. And if you, <laughs> you were kind of forced to use them all the time for projects or just going out in the street, doing whatever, working at a radio station, if you will. So I always have those skills and I've interviewed people. So, you know, it's, it's pretty awesome. All right, I'm going to stand up to get off. I'm listening, but just know that I'm, I'm making a move to the club, but, um, what school mm -hmm. did you go to? Me, I went to the SUNY College in Old Westbury. Shout out to all my Old West alumni, yes. current students. Old West was the college. But that was for my um, bachelor's, for my associates, media technology and management. Um, I went to Kingsborough Community College. So shout out to my <laughs> KBCC alumni as well. Yeah. Where is that? Definitely, is that in the um, Kingsborough Community College, that's a CUNY school in Brooklyn, yes, right on the water, very, very beautiful, I'm not going to lie there, their campus, uh, very beautiful. Wow, um, and you mm -hmm. learned communications in both schools? Yeah, so my associates was in media technology and management, the bachelor's was in media and communication, so pretty much the same thing, but... Um, an AAS, an Associate in Applied Science and uh, Media Technology and Management. It was, it was, uh, there was a intense focus on learning camera technologies. Um, so I worked with, uh, like Avid Media Composer nice. and, um, TV production, like doing all the different roles between the production assistant to the floor manager, literally making a whole TV commercial, which, oh my God, I still have that saved on a USB somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I made like a whole Sprite commercial, having to write an entire TV script. You have to do all those things. Um, video yeah. editing, we did a whole news program and uh it was it was uh, a very great experience but also uh my mass communication and films classes those were really excellent as well we we had chances to just like write about films and then like really study them like why did they use certain camera angles between medium close-up to close-ups to a certain lighting to convey a certain meaning so you know those type of classes uh were, were were very great to help me analyze media but at the bachelor's level it became a lot deeper for me i took all those skills that i had from my associates but um i started taking classes like hip-hop cultures which was really impactful for me i really loved that class it was so thorough shout out to dr jasmine mitchell she's a great pro great professor at suny college at old westbury and i'd also like to shout out um, one of my professors there, Dr. Archer, um, I took a class with him called Abolitionist Art to Hip Hop Iconography, where wow. we studied slave imagery and, um, and the abolitionist movement and how it corresponded with like hip hop album covers. Wow. So, for instance, yeah, you would take an image like, um, a slave, like running away and being chased by dogs like this is what they would show in the abolitionist movement this was uh this would go through their their media at the time like through their print media right yeah um and i would compare that with say nwa's 100 miles and running cover um where you see them running out of the city in prison gear and you see helicopters chasing after them which uh, for my final project, I would show um, pretty much the system is always hunting um, <laughs> African Americans, right? Oh, it's always hunting no. our people, uh, and 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 this is the reflection. Like you know, what we see today is uh, while 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 different, it is that same system of that 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 master slave. Um, kind of relationship where there there isn't a certain level of freedom. There are so many um, restrictions and disparities that have um, that have not been resolved. 
Um, so, you know, those great classes, they definitely help expand the consciousness. And I did so much more in college. It was just a really fun experience, especially when I was like uh, the news director for Old Westbury Web Radio over there. That was uh, very impactful for me because I got to cover a lot of great stories and really interview a lot of uh, pretty interesting people. <laughs> I think you're muted. Wait, hold on. Sorry, my. Mm Wait. Can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, good. Cause... All right, I'm in the car. <laughs> My so, cousin just joined. I'm as good as you, but I don't care. So. <laughs> you look so much better. Uh, Stop it. Sounds like a foundation a lot. You're kind of fading out. Say that again. I can't hear you. Yeah, a little okay, bit. Okay, am I back? I think I paused. I'm back. Yeah, you're back. You're the best. Um, those classes sound amazing. Congratulations on, on having the opportunity to take them. How, Thank you. How awesome. Um, and that, prob that helps you a lot in your... Are you a songwriter? Uh, yeah, songwriter, rapper, um, definitely musician for sure. <laughs> what kind of music do you like to make? So since I was the age of 11, when I started writing, rapping has been my dominant art that I've like ever since banging on the lunch table. So wow. um, hip hop has always yeah. been integral from my upbringing, growing up in like the inner city in Queens, it was a pretty rough environment. Um, just, you know, going to school every day. It almost felt like when I look back on like my middle school days, it felt like most days there were fights and just having to look over your back. But, you know, we had a lot of fun and we kind of did a lot of stupid things. But to take our mind off of a lot, um, at least for me, like rapping became one thing because I saw this kid at the lunch table. His name was Marquise. He would rap. And when he would rap, everyone would beat on the lunch table. The way he would just have the crowd around him and that level of attention. Um, I was really attracted to that. And I said, wow, I want that. I kind of want that too. So um, I was talking to my older brother, Calvin. Uh, who's seven years my senior. And this is when I was in sixth grade, by the way. Uh, and so I'm like, yo, I want to like, I want to do something. I think I want to battle this cat. Like I want to like definitely like battle. Him. And so um, I started writing. And the first line I ever wrote on paper, Joe Youngster used to be my pseudonym. That was like my first rap name. And I took it because of, um, you know, everyone calls me Joey, but I was always like, like very little at the time, um, like a youngster, if you will. So I kind of took it from this game, Pokemon Gold, and uh, I like that, that I always used to play on the Game Boy. <laughs> yeah. uh, youngster Joey, which is like the first Joey that you encounter on your path, right? <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, you know, when you battle with the, with the Rattatana, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? So. Bring him in that, that that's the that's the that's the name that I took, Joe Youngster, and uh, we battled one day. Uh, I lost the first time, but then I won another time, and so from there I was just like, you know, everyone's jumping all over you, like, oh, Joey said that, like, ah! you know, having all that attention. I was just like, wow, this is something I could do. But I was always listening to rap ever since I was the age of seven because of my older brother. Um, I remember coming home, well, my brother coming home with 
Jay Z's in my lifetime on a cassette. This would have probably been like the year, maybe like 1998. And I'm looking. I'm like probably seven years old, and I'm going like parental advisory, <laughs> and I have no idea what the hell that meant. But when my brother popped in the cassette, I'm hearing um, these incredibly explicit lyrics where he's. Where Jay-Z saying, I love bitches, rough bitches, shop bitches, it don't matter, you my bitch. That was like, ooh. <laughs> like, all these, you know, all this, all these expletives. I was just like, wow, it was incredible. But um, <laughs> that's how me and my older brother, we were, we were eventually able to bond in that way. Because um, we weren't as close initially. He was closer with my eldest brother because they were three years apart, him being seven years my senior. Um, you know, we really didn't have, like, m like much um, to go off of. So hip-hop is uh, definitely brought me and my older brother together in, in a very different way. And I could say he was essentially um, my mentor uh, as far as rapping goes because – uh, he would give me lyrics to remember, lyrics that he felt would be integral to help me build and cultivate my style. So that way I would become better as an artist. And he would incentivize me to do so by remembering lyrics from certain rappers. So he'd give me the song, print them out from, I forgot the name of the site, I think it was Ola.com. And he'd go like, yo, you remember this? You get $20. It would probably be from Nas's Illmatic. Um, what's the name of that song? New York State of Mind. I, I remember those were one of the Good first songs he gave me to remember. Uh, and he paid me $20 to remember that Nas song. And I said, oh, okay. Rappers, I'm monkey flipping with the funky rhythm. I'll be kicking. Musician, I was just like. And so I was gone like when I'm remembering all these lyrics, at that age, at maybe 11, I wasn't fully cognizant of what these rappers were saying. But at the same time, um, I understood the impact of the lyrics. I felt like the emotion behind what they were trying to relay to the listener. And as I got older, I'm just able to like, you know, say these lyrics over and over. And I think they eventually... Uh, Remembering those lyrics improved my diction in so many ways. Uh, I was never a big fan of like English in a sense. Um, when I was younger, I was put in, uh, classes like remedial for like, you know, writing in English and stuff like that. Even though I was always like a great, I guess, speller and I can always read well, but reading comprehension was always like a problem for me. I just, I guess maybe didn't like reading. So even. <laughs> yeah. When it came to sixth grade, seventh grade, I wasn't really captivated by many of the books that they would give us to read as students. Maybe they didn't speak to my experience. It, it just didn't really appeal to me. But hip hop sure did. But um, I had no idea that um, by the time I would hit high school, all the writing that I would do uh, definitely improved uh, my English to such a very different level and just my confidence to be able to get in front of people to be able to speak um, being able to rap like that it is a form of public speaking being able to battle against your opponent losing building your confidence to come back battle them again what this is doing this is a performance art it's essentially like theater in a sense right yeah, yeah. so Live, yeah. all those things would serve me well by the time I would get to high school and I read Shakespeare for the first time, and I think it was uh, the first time reading Shakespeare, that's when I really was fully captivated like, by the English language and what it could do, and I really wanted to know more. And throughout my entire like high school career, I think it was only my first semester of, of freshman English. I got maybe like a 75 for my um, grade point average, but from there, I was always excelling with 85 and then 90s, 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 so it was... Yeah, English was uh, became it became my love. A you know? positive challenge, and Shakespeare could be very daunting. You know, um, took me a while, yeah. took me a while to like accept him into my heart. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> but, but right. A lot oh of my these, god! Yeah, what you're saying also is a lot of these rappers use his um, what is that called? His structure. 
you know, the the number of beats in, in Shakespeare's writing and, and the way he, you know, enunciates. And Shakespeare set a, 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 a huge foundation for, for structure in, in, ra in a lot of music, you know. I, I, I use his structure in my music, you know. Right? <laughs> See, that's incredible. And it's not just like the structure, but the literary elements that right. Shakespeare incorporated, which is the same thing you would get from other readings. But uh, I saw how it mirrored hip hop so closely. Um, because of that structure, uh, just being able to look at like elements like foreshadowing, imagery, the symbolism, uh, the metaphors, the similes, and how I said, "Oh, wait a minute! This is what this is what we doing like when we're rapping." <laughs> I'm like, "This is what we do." So um, that that definitely enlightened me in a very different way to have uh, so much deeper appreciation for the English language. Yes, storytellers, right? Yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll come back to music because I want to talk more. But uh, what about your your marketing consulting business? Is this? It's K how, what is it? K E K E K U. So yes, yeah, Keku Consulting Group. Okay. I am the CEO and founder of Keku Consulting Group. Um, we are a digital marketing and information services agency. So pretty much if you're ever searching on Google and you're very hungry, you want to say, I want to find the best pizza near me. So when you look up for the best pizza near you, you're going to see some search results being yielded. And um, it's going to maybe populate something within some miles from you, but it's also going to populate what is like the most popular maybe based on the most reviews and all of that. So what I help businesses do, if uh, if they're lower ranking, um, I will help businesses with their SEO, uh, which stands for search engine optimization. We wanna make sure that we can help you um, gain on the rankings on Google, so that way you can attract more clientele for your business. And it's not just SEO that's important. It's also the pay-per-click, which is the paid advertising. But before doing paid advertising, it's always best to make sure you establish your online presence from a reputation management and SEO and Google My Business perspective. So Google My Business pretty much deals with anytime you're searching on Google, it's that little card that you have that says your address, um, your business name, uh, the Google reviews, that little card that shows up. So businesses have to set up what is, which is, what is, set up what is a Google My Business, which will also help you get set up. Um, and all of that, uh, without your online presence, it's very hard for your business to go anywhere. So you need to be showing up on social media platforms, some um, Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, and backlinks need to be created to ensure that you're showing up in all these places to make sure you're properly listed. Because in Google, there is an algorithm and that algorithm is very, very important. Uh, and you need to know how to feed it. And so Google's looking for many things as far as those listings go. Are you showing up on Yelp? Are you showing up on Siri? Are you showing up on like Google Maps? So we need to make sure, you know, a business is showing up in all these different places to properly establish their footprint. And that will essentially help them drive more clientele and attract people more to their business. What about individuals? Can you help an individual? Uh, like as you or I, can you, can you market an individual's business? An individual's business. Well, okay, we're talking about specific brands, which would be, in a sense, more like an affiliate marketing, a brand specifically for a person. Uh, yes, but, you know, the reason why I chose to essentially focus on um, just small businesses is because there are a lot of young entrepreneurs that are coming up, and they may not know how to essentially uh, market what they're doing. Um, I know real estate agents turn brokers who, you know, need assistance with their SEO. They have great skills, but without marketing, obviously no one can really go anywhere. So I want to help them. And especially when it comes to anyone, um, obviously I will help anyone, but 
I essentially also want to ensure that my services can be provided to people of color um, because, you know, there's not, like we want, I want to make sure that we're like, we're essentially having every resource available for our businesses to essentially thrive. And so that, that is really my focus. I mean, down the line, um, any individuals who want to do some type of branding for maybe like, I don't know, you know what I'm talking about when individuals want to brand for, uh, I guess, a, a photo shoot, something that they're doing. Like, but yeah, my, my, my focus is not like really on an individual. It's really like small businesses and anyone who is looking for that service. That's what I do at this time. We also help, um, individuals with their websites. So yeah, if you're an individual and you're looking for a website set up, I can certainly, you know, help with doing that. Um, and we're talking about new websites like that are very interactive. Like we, we, we definitely have templates that will definitely set someone on the right path. So it's not just the SEO portion, but um, the website build and those are the services, um, the services I essentially offer at this time. That's awesome. Congratulations. How old is the business? Or young? My business will be how young it is. January, what, January 13th. Sheesh, if I'm not mistaken, it will probably be a year, almost as of today, or maybe a couple of days wow. ago, or approaching. Happy anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the baby. Oh, it take, what does it take, like five years for like a true success story, right? Yeah, yeah, I can. You know, running a business is tough, but um, I, t- I think it was a com- incumbent upon myself to um, find resources. I, I am very thankful. I had a great mentor to be able to point me in the right direction who already had a successful digital marketing agency. And I was able to, you know, learn from what they did and, um, pretty much use that to my benefit. So that way I can help other people. So I'm thankful for that. That investment in myself is what allowed me to, definitely have a strong footing right out the gate so speaking of mentors do you have any inspirations that helped you get to who you are you said your brother and and your mentor anyone anyone else who stands out to help you to help to how you got to who you are yeah so many people i could (laughs) say when i used to work for (laughs) the tech company like when i used to troubleshoot for tv phone and internet right I've had great supervisors um, with whom I looked at as great leaders within the company, like I want to be like them, you know, Um, even in my current field, what I do, because an extension of my business is the information services side. I do healthcare IT. So we pretty much, I pretty much build clinical um, information systems so that way clinicians can document uh, for patient care, you know, doctors, nurses, like medical assistants. Uh, and that's what I do, building those clinical environments so they can document for patient care. And um, I may be consulted for those services. So that is something I also do through my business. Um, it is a consulting business. When I think of like SEO, digital marketing and all of that, um, it's really looking at, all right, a person's business or, you know, what, what is the need? And I am there to consult the person on like, all right, this is the best way we can deliver upon that result. And so whether I'm doing it in the digital marketing capacity or the healthcare IT, um, you know, I really, really take pride in what I do. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Yeah. I guess it's just good to have that kind of drive for people in general, right? <laughs> yeah, and and then and technology is life these days. Look at us right now, right? Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, right now. I almost say for for those who are watching, this is like I've been on IG live before, but for my first time, like I never did it with anyone else before. So this is my first time with someone else. But the first time I ever went on IG Live was actually very fantastic. It was back in 2019. And I went to Puerto Rico for my birthday in 2019. But you know what was also happening like around that time? 
Do you remember the protests outside of the governor's mansion in Puerto Rico when they were calling him to resign and people were like protesting like like for hours and hours on end with like, you know, yeah. So I was there for those protests. Wow. Like, you know, and yeah, it's, CNN, it's the entire story, media yeah. was covering that. That's yeah, exactly. So, hey, I low key, I, I participated in the protest. It was like, it was pretty, it was pretty amazing to be, be, be down there with the locals and, uh, yeah. you know, really finding out like, um, the, the corruption that was going on in Puerto Rico and why, why they were calling for its resignation. But, yeah, that's a that's a whole nother story. That's the first time I've been on IG Live. Um but yeah, there there's a really cool experience. Tech is very important. Um during COVID, you know, as you know, the military moved to uh virtual environment, predominantly virtual, and we have adopted that most likely for the long term. <laughs> Probably not going back yeah. because it's essentially very convenient. And that's not just in the public sector, but in the private sector. Uh, many businesses have seen that, you know, productivity it remained either the same or has increased when people are able to work from home and do what they need to do. And they find that they're able to save on not having to pay for office space. So, um, Moving to that type of environment, there are resources that you need to make sure you have in place as far as like cybersecurity goes and just like educational things to make sure everyone is abreast of like, okay, how do we make sure we're the most effective always in a virtual environment? And I think it works. You know, I, I, I'm very happy in many ways and different organizations and even the military for me to be able to help out with like spearheading that effort to make sure everyone's like on the same page like this is how we do this and um in my head i'm not gonna lie sometimes i think like yo this stuff is easy like you know kind of the caveman could do it right but when i sit back when i sit back and you know pull everything back i realize tech is still something that not everyone will always have a grasp on and that is okay so um my main focus what i'm thankful for um is that uh my tech background from the cable company combined with the media and communications, I think it has allowed me in a way um, to carry out trainings effectively because in order to be in media, you need to know how to take something that's complex, but um, reduce it to its most simplest form. So that way your average person can understand it. Right? And yeah, exactly. And I think that has always helped me out a lot, especially uh, just in anything that I'm doing that has to do with tech. Because when, when I have to explain it to someone, I, you know, I know I have to eliminate all the jargon and just go like, hey, make sure that they can fully understand it and make it easy because that, that's the problem with tech. It sounds, it sounds very scary to most people, especially when it comes to, um, you know, I invest in crypto. Crypto is like very, I'm very big into crypto. And a lot of people think it's hard to invest in it, but uh, you just need to understand key fundamentals to navigate that space. And you realize that investing in cryptocurrency isn't that hard, but um, most people don't kind of have that type of guidance or that breakdown to help them understand that. So uh, they get incredibly deterred from, um, you know, navigating those spaces because it looks like a, a, a totally foreign language to them. Yeah, people shut down very easily. And meanwhile, crypto is the future. There's no doubt about it. And people just are so closed off to it. And, like every time I try to tell someone, you know, some people are like, oh, I'm never doing that. I'm like, well, I bet you're going to have to probably one day, you know. Um, but yeah, the uneducated. Yeah, a boss is going to make them do it. <laughs> yeah, a boss is going to be making them do it. <laughs> someone, right? They're going to need it. Like, like they need cash somewhere, right? Like even in Europe, I think they were going cashless in some places. But um, that's... Chief Chief wrote is some sassy comments, but uh, can you see he has? Unless I don't know what he's talking. What are you talking about, Chief? The ten-year building lease. I don't know. He called me late though, so I'm ignoring that. <laughs> but I'm Chief. Well, shout out to you, Chief. Lu Lucius Fox. Lucius 
Hey, yeah, day. Shout out to you, cuz. What's up? Yeah, one one other person said something. Let me see. Oh, oh I think I'm missing people. Oh, Lenny. <laughs> Shout out to you, Lenny. A lot, of, a lot of people coming coming in. Um. Oh, so so you're into crypt. You're into crypto. Do you teach crypto or? I can't say I particularly um teach crypto, but maybe unofficially I do, right? <laughs> People are always consulting me, asking me. Um, I am not a financial advisor, <laughs> to put that out there. Right. But what I certainly do help out is with the technical aspects of people. Um, people inquiring on like, hey, uh, what platforms can I use to like invest in crypto? So uh, I love speaking about those. Commonly people think um, that they should just go on Robinhood and invest in whatever crypto is available. Um, if you ask me personally, I'm really not a fan of places like Robinhood, um, given the situation that happened with GameStop. Yeah, that was a problem, <laughs> Like, y yeah, exactly. Uh, a platform that advertised itself as, like, being for the people and making trading, like, kind of easier. You can see that they're aligned with the corporatist agenda that when it really boils down to it, you know who they're in alignment with. It's it's really not for the people because they shut down like trading and ensured people weren't being like kind of paid out, <laughs> you know, on their profits right, in right. order to protect not, institutional that's investors. That's not a true stock market, right? Exactly. So, you know, as a as a brokerage, they, I guess they have every right to do that. But what they advertise is just not not really cool. So um, what I recommend, you know, people will obviously go on Coinbase. I, Coinbase on is Coinbase still a, <laughs> you're on Coinbase, right? Coinbase is a very great platform to start. But once again, you're still limited as far as to what cryptocurrencies you can invest in. Yes, yeah, um, they don't have like moon, whatever. And yeah, it's true. Exactly. So I, I recommend people always um set up a wallet. Um, there are many like MetaMask. Um, the but but the one that I use is called Trust Wallet. Uh, Trust Wallet has what is called a D apps in it. It's pretty much think of it as a web browser within the actual app itself that gives you access to you know applicate like crypto applications that allow you to invest in coins that aren't typically accessible on in places like Coinbase and Robinhood. Now, obviously using a wallet or investing in coins that aren't on the major platforms like Coinbase, those are riskier investments. Yeah. But um everyone should always do their research when it comes to following the coins. You know, there was a interview that i saw recently by um between russell brand and jordan belliford and, and if if yeah. people don't know who he is the wolf of wall street guy right and he was talking about why people invest in cryptocurrency now versus like stocks like why are like a lot of young people more interested in investing in cryptocurrency and he pointed out that all the institutional knowledge you need, all all the practical application that you have to learn from going through schooling, working in Wall Street, there there is a lot of niche knowledge that is needed in order to like really understand the stock market. Um, but with cryptocurrency, not so much. And um, uh, and some might perceive that in a way to go like, well, he's making it sound like cryptocurrency is much easier. Uh, that's not what he was really suggesting. Uh, but it, it, but it is to say there is not there is not all that hogwash, all all that stuff that it, it's almost like elitist knowledge, if you will. You have to be part of that that good old boys club in order to like have that knowledge and to be able to do that. With cryptocurrency. You don't need any of that. And All you need is like right. your phone. It's not yeah. as um, it's, controlled. It's more free for the people. Like it's not as is controlled by the of whoever, right? So that's also cool, you know. Exactly. At least not yet. But right, I don't even right. like to say not yet because it sounds like I'll be bringing that into the unit. But there is increasing <laughs> legislation that is happening by the right, day right. where it shows that um 
you know, government agencies and uh, whatnot. They're they're trying to have their hand in crypto to try to m- mitigate the amount of profits that the common person like me and you have off of investing in crypto. And um, we have to be aware of that and make sure we fight back against it, right? You know? Um, so... <laughs> So Trust Wallet is a good place. There are, there are certain apps within there called like Pancake Swap, which allows you to invest in coins on what is called the Binance Smart Chain. And then you have Uniswap, which is another exchange that you can access within Trust Wallet that allows people to invest in what are called ERC-20 tokens, which are coins that exist on the Ethereum blockchain. There are multiple blockchains, if you will, but those are two very popular ones. So... When coins are first released, they need to go through a process. uh, This is almost like project management, if you will. There are certain key things that they have to hit. And one of the main things, they they need to get listed on what is called CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap. Those are two apps that people could download, right? And they can see all the newest cryptocurrencies that are being released on those apps. So once a coin gets listed on CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap, it establishes a sense of legitimacy to show that they're listed only only in the sense that investors are now looking at those coins and uh it it will attract a lot of swing traders and a lot of volume to go into that coin for that brief period that it initially gets listed so um it's very important that when coin projects start off crypto coins um when they first start off that they get listed on those two major exchanges but once again people still need to do their research because there could always be scam coins and in order to avoid investing in those scam coins um people need to understand how to look in at contracts and the contract is pretty much what the, everything, the code that was written behind that actual coin. And that exists on, like, if it's a Binance token that, uh, a coin that you're investing in, which exists on the Binance smart chain, you could go to what is called the bscscan.com and you can look at the contract and see, like, what is the tax? Um, are they blocking trading? Like, is it what is called like a honeypot? Meaning it's like a hotel California function. You could buy, (laughs) but you can't sell. You you know, you could check in, but you could never check out. So it seems like they're making uh, coins every day. It's like, why would I invest in every single coin that comes out? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It it would just be impossible to invest in every single coin. (laughs) So, you know, um, many coins that I find uh, very attractive to invest in, uh, are called um, reward tokens. So pretty much their tokenomics behind it. And what I mean by tokenomics, uh, pretty much a coin has what are called their tokenomics. It, it details, they should always detail on their website, what is their buy tax? What is their sale tax? How much um, percentage is being dedicated to, you know, the liquidity? What percentage of the tokens are being burned? Or, you know, so all of those tokenomics people should be looking at. But reward tokens pretty much pay people and what is called um well most commonly a stable coin and what a stable coin is is a coin that is pegged to pretty much a fiat currency um typically the united states dollar so you'll have coins that are called like busd which is binance version of the united states dollar there's um there's usdc um and many others that are pegged to the united states dollar so what happens is when people invest in those coins um they will be paid accordingly to the 24 hour volume that is happening on that particular token but when they get paid it's not in that coin they invested in they're getting they're getting literally rewards. Think of it as a dividend, like in stocks, right? They're getting a dividend in in that fiat currency, uh, in that fiat cryptocurrency, BUSD. So those coins are pretty attractive because um, it is now changing the game uh, as far as like, allowing people to make passive income off of cryptocurrency. Uh, and the main coin that was like really a trendsetter for that, as far as like paying people in, um uh you know a fiat pegged like a uh, token would be uh evergrow coin it's one people should you know definitely do their 
research on. Mm -hmm. I mentioned them, but once again, do your research. But yeah, those those kind of coins are very you attractive. You know, this is too much for my brain to. I don't have my notepad. You better text me this after. But um, hey, feel free to please. contact me. And anyone watching this, Joey Kudo, uh, J O E Y K U D O. Of course, you see my name in the chat. So please feel free to follow me. Ask me any questions about crypto. I'm willing to answer I, for I anything. Need, I need to know more. Um, but I have five. We have a few minutes, and I want to ask you for a deep quote and an enlightenment experience to share because that's my favorite part of the show usually. I, you and I could talk for days. That's the problem. So hit hit me with a quote. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorites in recent days is when I let go of what I am, I become what I might be. <laughs> and it's a pretty powerful. It's a pretty powerful quote for me. Um, what it means when I let go of what I am. Um, pretty much trying to stick rigidly to, I guess, a certain self-identity of, like, kind of who we think we are, sticking rigidly to, like, a certain identity of what you do or where you feel like you kind of belong in this world. You could really, like, sort of, like, limit yourself um, as far as, like, not thinking outside of the box. You um, may not have certain options available to you because you're thinking within a, a, a confined space not really expanding your mind, but it's not just about your mind. It's it's like kind of the essence of who you are because you have to kind of let go of who you are. It's almost like a butterfly going through, I'm sorry, a caterpillar going through its cocoon uh, before it turns into a butterfly. You need to shed off what, uh, what was you consider your existing identity, who you think you are and um, be able to strive and, you know, to become who you might be. There are many possibilities. There's this fork in the road. There's that fork in the road. There's that fork in the road. You need to be able to enable yourself to see all paths and go like, that is okay. Not to be scared of them, not to fear them, but to know that it is okay to traverse along any path and know that you'll be fine because you're able to shed and grow in any direction. It doesn't matter which. And that that level of versatility will allow you to always adapt to any situation, like in my view. And it's not, it's in essence, losing who you are, but it, it's actually growing who you are. Um, because who you are is contingent upon growth. And if that growth is not happening, then you truly aren't yourself. You become something that's... Uh, I wouldn't even want to fathom an, an idea of what that could possibly be, but I don't think it's good at all, if you know what I mean. You you said versatility, and I'm going to add two Vs to that. Vessel, <laughs> vessel and vulnerable, because I feel like that's the, it's yes, very scary to lose your identity because we're, you know, we're, we can identify with an uh, infinite amount of things and it's it's fun to identify right it's like oh this is who i am but it's not it's there's a pride and an ego behind that it's not you're supposed to be an open vessel you get stuck right mm -hmm. and it's and you know christina yeah i mean i don't i don't want to get stuck i want to keep learning and growing but it, it hurt it does hurt to to lose your identity because yeah, we have these vehicles we're in. It's a fourth V, but maybe we'll add it with the vessel. But um, <laughs> you know, it's it's just it's just scary. It's like, oh, I'm not a you know an Irish Italian from Long Island. It's like, no, I'm a human being on planet Earth. Like, and that's still identifying. It's like we we put ourselves in a box every thought we, and I think that's more for survival though, right? For judgment of of who, what, when, where, and why, but. Um, it's scary to just lose what I am, who I am, you know, you're let, letting your mind run its course. Obviously you make your choices, but, uh, it's just, a, it's a scary place. Sometimes it could be scary. You know? It is to embrace that fear mm, takes a hell of a lot of courage, but it is certainly necessary. <laughs> yeah, that's what, uh, as you said, all these great rappers and artists did, right? They took the risk to be, to let the art guide them rather than them 
guiding the art. I mean, they it's probably a 50-50 of, of sorts, but uh, they don't, you, they're not in full control over, over the messaging, right? Exactly. That's right. <laughs> Awesome. You're the best, jo uh, Joey. I, I don't know how to say that. Joey, I love that name. But I know you as Pierre, hey. you know, Pierre. <laughs> Bob Browski, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My fellow Long Islander. Forget Long about Island. <laughs> Oh my god, I could be on for so many episodes. If you want to come back for a full crypto, let me know because that's that I need to like spin process, you know, that's a lot of information. Oh, bring me on. I actually have um one of my boys who I went to high school with. We we were talking the other day. He's he's well versed in crypto as well. Um fantastic guy, uh MMA fighter as well. <laughs> good good guy. Uh, so yeah. All right, I'm putting you down. Again, maybe maybe in uh, like uh, March or something. I'll just manifest it. Yeah, let's do it. I always come back on. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you for coming on. Keep writing your music. Keep rapping, man. And uh, I God bless you and your family and your babies. I we didn't talk a lot about them, but I I know they're safe in your hands. So you're the best. Much obliged. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Thank <laughs> well. you, everyone. As you want to say goodbye to your fans. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Godspeed. Godspeed. Thanks. Bye, Joey. Yeah. Blessing. All right. Take care. <laughs> sure. I guess. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Cal Kent. Thank you, Lisa. I see you, Chief. Appreciate you. Andre, a whole bunch of people. Thank you, Tanil. I see you. Uh, Kenny, Karen, Lewis. Wow, a lot of folks came on, Lee. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for bearing with me in this uh, train situation. And um, Joey Pierre, Joey Kuda, he's the best. And we'll have him get, uh, get on soon. Take care of yourselves. Thank you for calling me Meryl Chief. I appreciate you. <laughs> and we all have to catch up again soon. I miss you guys. Um, blessings. Stay safe. Hydrate. Meditate. Walk. Whatever. Take care of yourselves. Love you.